Chapter 22 has a lot of large anatomy, predominantly of the conducting zone, and then some microscopic anatomy of the respiratory zone that you should cover. Next up, the pressures in the pleural cavity versus the pulmonary pressure can be confusing. Make sure you know that the intrapulmonary pressure should always equilibrate to about one atmosphere, whereas the intrapleural pressure is always a little bit negative. Without that negative pressure, when the ribs move, they would not pull the lungs along for the ride. We talked about regions of the brain and how to control airflow and blood flow to the lungs. So you'll have to brush up on your sympathetic and parasympathetic effects. There was also a fair amount of physiology when it comes to how hemoglobin transports oxygen through the bloodstream. Remember, hemoglobin has two jobs. It needs to be able to pick up oxygen, but it also needs to be able to let go. And it switches roles in different environments based off of temperature, pH, and other factors. The alveoli of the lungs are composed of a simple squamous epithelium, septal cells, which generate surfactant, and macrophages. As we travel up the airways, the epithelium transitions into a ciliated pseudostratified epithelium. In cystic fibrosis, there's a mutation to a chloride transport protein, which normally moves chloride ions to the apical surface of the lungs. Water would next follow by osmosis, and this would help to moisten mucus, making it easier for the mucus to be removed from the body by the cilia. Without this protein, the mucus dries up and becomes thick, and it can no longer do its job. Debris and pathogens remain in the lungs rather than get removed. This can lead to damage to the lungs and numerous infections. One treatment for CF is the inhalation of an aerosolized solute. It doesn't have to be chloride, it could just as easily be glucose. Glucose molecules on the apical surface of the lungs would also attract water, which would help moisten mucus, making it easier for the body to remove the mucus and reduce the number of lung infections. Cystic fibrosis is an example of an obstructive disease. These diseases are classified in that there is a limit placed on the flow of air in and out of the lungs. This leads to a reduction in the FEV1 value. Restrictive diseases, on the other hand, somehow limit the size of the lungs, and this causes a reduction in the FVC value. Emphysema is an example of an obstructive disease. In this disease, the alveolar walls break down. Rather than having a lot of small air pockets that can change in size a small amount, we instead have very large pockets, just a few of them, that still only change a small amount. This makes it very difficult for the person to exhale. While we're on this picture, let's discuss ventilation-perfusion coupling. This is a mechanism by which gas exchange can be maximized, making sure that airflow and blood flow match throughout the lungs. Chemoreceptors can detect carbon dioxide and oxygen levels inside of the alveoli. When they detect a rise in CO2, that's translated as not enough oxygen, the bronchioles will try and fix this problem by bronchodilating in this area. There's another way that we can fix this problem. We can send the blood to alveoli that have more oxygen. We do this by vasoconstricting. Conversely, when CO2 levels drop, the bronchioles will constrict because there's already enough air flowing to this area, and the arterioles will dilate. This helps to maximize gas exchange by ensuring that blood flow and air flow always match. Without this, most of the blood would sink to the bottom of the lungs, and most of the air would float up to the top. Instead, we're squeezing some of that air downwards and squeezing some of that blood upwards. 
Lastly, there are also stretch receptors on the lungs. When the lungs begin to overinflate, these receptors signal to the brain and shut off inspiration. So it is not possible for us to overinflate our lungs. You might think that this is to protect the delicate lung tissue, but lung tissue is actually pretty tough. This helps to protect bone and muscle tissue surrounding the lungs as well. The conducting portion of the respiratory tract begins up in the head and travels down through the thorax to the lungs. These parts of the airways simply transmit air. No gas exchange occurs here. If the epiglottis did not do its job and liquid or food were to travel down the trachea, when it hit the carina, it would most likely go down the right side, not the left. That's because the right main bronchus is much larger than the left one. It connects to three lobes, whereas the left one only to two. It also connects at a steeper angle, hence gravity can help pull objects down this tube. The left main bronchus travels at a 90 degree angle, so it would be less likely for objects to travel down the left side. Lastly, there are a couple conditions that can cause excessive bronchoconstriction. These can be treated with sympathomimetics, or drugs that mimic or activate the sympathetic nervous system, because this will lead to bronchodilation. In the case of anaphylactic shock, we go with the strongest, fastest acting drug, which is injection of epinephrine into the bloodstream. When treating asthma, however, epinephrine is too strong and has too many side effects, for instance on the heart. Instead, we use a chemical that preferentially binds to the alpha adrenergic receptors, which are found on the lungs, more so than it does to the beta adrenergic receptors found on the heart. Drugs like albuterol have bigger effects on the lungs than other sympathetic target organs.